the only one in the county system, and I am your flat pathologist. You know, I'm, I'm hired by the county. I serve, you know, anybody in the county I run the plant disease clinic can bring in their, their plant samples. It's free. Oh, wait, you, can you hear me? Do I need to hold this closer? Yeah, that's better. Okay. <laughs> it's free. And um, we want people to bring things in because if there are new pests out there, of which we get a lot, an amazing, amazing number of them, um, then we want to get rid of them as quickly as you can. If you can find it early and eradicate it, that is the best way to deal with something besides keeping it out in the first place. <laughs> and so I snuck in lots of pictures. And so um, this one, we probably, unless it starts raining, we probably won't see a lot of that, but that's penicillin mold on a citrus fruit, pretty common. All right, plant pathology is the study of plant diseases. And most of the people who get a degree in plant pathology work for universities. They become professors or technicians in the various labs. Um, so they're, they're doing research. There are also a lot of them in corporate in the corporate world, working for like chemical companies, working for plant breeding companies because you want to breed your plants free of certain diseases. So you've got to have somebody trained in how to handle the diseases. And there are so many of us. There there are kind of few of us in diagnostics, where we actually you know have a clinic and try to you know figure out exactly what is going on with the with the sick plant. And a lot of times, in, like in my case also, they're for regulatory purposes, which is for the protection of the environment, and, or certification of health for movement of material. As you might know, San Diego County has the most nurseries of any other county in the nation. We have more nurseries here, and they are always shipping stuff all over the place, you know, all over the world. Thousands of shipments go to other countries every year, and that, you know, they need to make money, <laughs> or they don't stay in business, and or even to another state, or even a different part of California. These, these have to be certified for plant health, and that's what our nursery inspectors do in the department. And so they're always bringing me samples too, going, okay, is this free from such and such so that they can ship it to this place? So that is a lot of what we do, a lot of certification to keep business moving. And also incoming inspections. We get a lot of plant material from other places too, where there's truckloads of it coming in from Florida every week. And we want that to be clean, so the inspectors are also checking incoming material. So, and we find a few things every now and then. Um, and also we, you know, if the grower, the nursery, whoever wants help with what it is, what's going on, why is my plant sick, you know, why are my cuttings petering out, we help them with diagnosis on that too. So, and um, there's another one of the little invasives. Remember when daylilies didn't have rust? <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that long ago that um, daylilies, that daylily rust came in from Central America. I think it got into Florida and Georgia first and it quickly spread all over the United States really fast. And the, the, um, the, the, what people first started saying when the rust first got here was just, oh, cut off the leaves and it'll be okay. Well, what happens with rust spores when you disturb them? <laughs> they were going right down into the center of the plant where the new growth comes out, and the new growth was coming out infected with the rust right off the bat. So that's what those little golden specks are. They are the, the fungus spores. So anyway, it was a quarantine pest at first, but it spread and got around so fast it's no longer a quarantine pest. But the breeders have come up with varieties that are resistant to it, so that would be the best way to get around it. Okay, back to hardcore plant pathology. This is the best part. <laughs> to me, plant pathology is where you put it all together, and you go, okay, this is what is causing a problem to this plant. You know, you have to have knowledge of soils, you have to have knowledge of the plant. The first step is, what the heck is the plant anyway? <laughs> and um, and the, all the various things that go wrong with it. So this is where plant pathology is where you put it all together and actually come out with an answer, you hope. But so a disease is a harmful alteration of normal development. And it's complex, 
and occurs over time. So something that happens really fast, like you sprayed it, you accidentally sprayed it with a herbicide and the next day you realize, oops, <laughs> my plant is looking, looking a little crispy. That is not a disease. That's a damage. That's an injury. So, okay, and then of course, apple scab, I worked that in here. Our Anna apple, which is pretty common here, is pretty susceptible to apple scab, which is a fungal disease. That's what's causing all this black stuff on there. And you can scrape that off and put it under the microscope and see all the little spores. So, that's not always fun. Okay, just some basic terminology that is really helpful, because once you, when you get a sample in, say, you know, the homeowner came in with this plant and you're looking at it, the first thing you try to do is identify what the heck is the plant. So figure out the plant, the next thing to do is find out what, this, what they're concerned about. What are the symptoms both the, the homeowner is seeing and what you are seeing? And um, a couple of these, you probably won't use them necessarily with the homeowner because chlorosis is a kind of vague word, but it means it's yellow. <coughs> so are the leaves yellow? Is it, is it chlorotic? So what's the pattern of chlorosis on it? Is it just between the veins? Is it the veins? Is it the whole thing? Is it just the new growth? Is it just the young growth? You know, look at the patterns too. Necrosis means the cells are dead. You know, you've got dead leaves, the whole shoot is dead, the edges of the leaves are dead. Figure out where you've got that necrosis if it's there. And um, a sign is the actual pathogen, the actual like fungus on there, like the black mold on those little apples, the orange rust on the daylily leaves. That's the actual organism causing the problem. And a symptom is it's chlorotic, it's dying back, it's wilting, those kinds of things. So. Okay, and, if, and you have to hear about the triangle because that's just what plant pathology does. <laughs> you need all of these things to, to cause a disease. Um, you, and the host is there, that's the plant. There's all sorts of plants out there, so they're ready to get sick at any time. <laughs> and by the way, just because you guys now know that plants get sick, you know, you're, you're smarter already than 99% of the population at least because most people don't even know that plants get sick. So, and that sometimes you can do something about it. So, there are, there are plenty of hosts out there and there are plenty of pathogens out there. Things that cause the disease, a virus, a bacteria, yeah, um, a fungus, a lot of those things out there. What, what's key here is the environment. You need the right environment for it to work. It's got to be the right temperature, the right humidity. Some fungi need free water to, for the spores to germinate, so that it, you won't see it unless you have free water out there. You know, um, a lot of diseases take a break during the winter when it's really cold. Not you would notice that this year, but uh, so you've got to have the right environmental conditions for it to happen. And our job is to tip the environmental conditions the opposite way to favor the plant rather than favoring the pathogen, which might mean like cutting back on water, time, you know, timing the water differently so you have less free water time on the leaves, things like that. Okay, so when I look at a plant, when I look at a sample coming in, the steps in diagnosis that I go through, what's the plant? Yeah, that, that really helps. A lot of people don't know, that's okay. We'll work on it. Then I encourage them to make, bring in a big enough sample so that I can identify the plant. <laughs> that helps. You'd be amazed. Sometimes you get tiny little bits of leaf and you're going, hmm. <laughs> a little bit of dead stick and you're, uh, and a teaspoon of soil. And you're like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but we'll try. So keep them talking. Find out as much as you can about how they take care of it. A lot, it's surprising to me, but a lot of people don't know how often their sprinklers go off. You know, they don't know when they're watering. Um, so find out what you can about the soil. Is it heavy clay soil? You know, is it decomposed granite? What, what, find out as much from them as you can. Um, what signs and symptoms can you see? What's obvious on there? 
what is disturbing the, the person who made them bring the sample in. And then I usually go to the microscope. So I look at it through the microscope, often tear it apart, often shred it. it you know, these are destructive things. They usually don't get their plant back. <laughs> I have to tell me ahead of time because, because I'm going to cut it up under the microscope and look. So you're looking, you know, I'm looking for mites, I'm looking for fungal spores, I'm looking for anything that's obvious that you can, that's really, really tiny. And then we'll go to other tests. We'll culture things. Um, we don't do virus testing or bacteria testing in my lab. I send that up to the state lab in Sacramento if I think it needs it. <laughs> so um, all that DNA stuff, that's all up there. So and, and uh, we snuck in here. The, we, we are losing our Phoenix canariensis palm slowly but surely. This is a disease that was first reported in San Diego County again for the first time in the United States in the 70s. And since then it's been moving around, moving around, killing Phoenix palm trees. So, you know, and once this is a fungus, that's once it's in the soil, it's there forever. Mm -hmm. You won't get it out. So you can't plant another Phoenix palm back in that safe hole. So just, just a warning, you know, some people do and they let it be until it dies and then they pay $10,000 to get it taken out and a new one put in. But it's, this is a fatal disease of these palms and it's soil borne and it lives there forever. And it moves around on unclean, pruning tools. So you cannot clean a chainsaw properly, you know, so when you're, <laughs> you, know, you, you just can't. It, it gets all the spores and all the particles. So some of these people who go through and prune these trees with a chainsaw really rapidly and then go to the next one and the next one and the next one, they just spread it to all those other trees. The gas and electric company is, you know, pretty good at this too. So yes. I'm sorry, did you say the name of the pathogen? It is Fusarium. Fusarium. Fusarium is the name of the, the genus name of the fungus. The species name is Oxysporum, Fusarium Oxysporum. And then it's even got, there's like 200 species of Fusarium. And this one's even more specific. It's Fusarium Oxysporum Forma Specialis Canariensis, which means it only goes to the Canary Island Dane Paul. <laughs> so it's really, this particular pathogen is really specific to this. So, because there are all kinds of fusarium, and some are just natural inhabitants of the soil, don't cause a problem. Others cause a problem on tomatoes. Um, so, there's lots of different kinds of fusarium. So, if, if you're doing, uh, if we're looking for this disease in a plant and it's a nursery sample, just to confirm, because if it's in a nursery, we're going to have to destroy those plants because you can't, you know, legally sell a disease plant in the state of California. And um, so then we send it to the state lab in Sacramento for a DNA test to confirm that it's all the way down to that form of specialis. But if it's just in the environment and I've got fusarium coming out of a homeowner sample, it's like, huh, oh, that's it. <laughs> yes? How would you destroy that tree so as not to spread spores, you know what I mean? How? Right. It's, I've, I've seen it in my neighborhood and my neighbors say, oh, you know, what's going on? And, <laughs> Pretty much they bury them. Really? Yeah. Where? Um, well, if it's at a nursery, they tend to do it on site. Because, well, they have smaller trees sometimes too, but they tend to bury it on site because landfill costs are pretty expensive. But then they affect their soil, right? Right. Well, there, but at a nursery, you're not normally growing in soil, you're growing it in a container. Mm -hmm. Though these two plants don't, don't do it very well in a container. These like to grow in the ground. So it depends on how big they're selling them. But a lot of nurseries have just said, okay, we can't guarantee that these are always clean and we're not, just not going to sell them anymore. They've gotten out of the business of this type of home because of this disease. So, you know, plant diseases affect how, you, how people live and you don't even realize it right off the bat. So, okay. Um, things that cause a problem on a plant, can we, you can divide them. You've got to start dividing them anywhere because anything can cause a problem in a plant pretty much. So, um, one good way to do it is abiotic versus biotic. 
Abiotic are non-living things that cause a problem in a plant. Biotic are living things that cause a problem in a plant. So, um, and they don't spread. An abiotic pathogen is non-infectious, doesn't spread around. So things that could be that are environmental stress, you know, excessive heat, excessive soil salt levels, nutrient deficiencies, air pollution, that kind of stuff. This one, um, pretty common, edema, you see it on ivy, you see it on eucalyptus. It's when the cells pop, because it happens under conditions often of cool nights, and then people irrigate early morning, say, and then the temperature, so the humidity is really high right at the ground level where the leaves are, then the temperature rises really fast. Sun comes up and the temperature starts going, and the plant's getting hot, so it's trying to cool off. It opens its pores, Plants cool off by opening pores and, and releasing water and evaporating water off of them, kind of like we sweat, but, and that cools them down. But if the humidity is really high, they, it doesn't, you can't evaporate that water off, and then the, those cells are full of water trying to evaporate it off, and they just pop. And that's what causes edema. <coughs> so, you know, well, cells full of water that they can't get the water off, and they just pop. So another th problem is nutrient deficiency. So this is where you uh, get zinc deficiency on citrus is one example. Citrus also has a lot of nitrogen deficiency. Um, intervenal chlorosis is what you call that. The veins are still green, and the intervenal areas are yellow, so it's intervenal chlorosis. So here's, here's one. What do you think might do something like that? Irrigation. The irrigation is not moving. No, this one is an irrigation that somebody else said it back here. I heard it. Fertilizer. They went through with a, you know, they, they were delivering the fertilizer with one of those little carts and they missed some stripes. <laughs> so that's, that's irregular fertilizer application. <laughs> Okay, here's um, this is a rose bush, and that is a berry bush. And um, okay, we're still abiotic here. So, what do you think might cause these kinds of distortions? Want to take a guess? Pollution. Yeah, get close. You might want to notice that down here on the ground, there's no plants growing. I heard it round up. Somebody said it back there. Yeah, that is that is round non-lethal roundup injury on the on rose on the rose family. The whole rose family. I've seen it in apple orchards. You know, um, they're really susceptible to roundup injury. Just a breath causes those weird distortions, and they call them shoestring leaves. Sometimes the leaves get really long and skinny, look kind of look like a shoestring. So. Um, yeah, watch out for Roundup around the Rose Valley. Okay, that one didn't, that one's kind of dark, but okay, you've got these interesting looking ring spots on African violet. Fuzzy leaf, want to take a guess? Water droplets? Water droplets. Cold water coming right out of the faucet first thing in the morning in the winter, or, you know, outside or in a nursery, and that cold just damages the leaf just enough to make that ring spot kind of pattern. Okay, now we get to the biological causes of plant disease. <laughs> now that we've had a few examples of that. So, um, okay, these are bio, biotic agents, bio, life, living organisms that multiply and spread, including viroids, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and nematodes. And that's a little nematode right in there. That, that is a pratolinchus, a lesion nematode that lives in the, it moves around from soil to inside the root, hangs out inside the root, cruises around, damages a lot of things, a lot of tissue. It's got a, a needle-like <coughs> stylet right here, and it's, that's its mouth part. That's the tail part. Um, and it, it punctures cells and sucks the contents out of them. And it just cruises around doing that, and a few million of those in the soil can really do significant damage to a tree. 
or any plant. So. But, but if we eat with the food raw, what, are, what is the nematode doing in our bodies? <coughs> Nothing. That kind of nematode, it's, it's, ob, it's called an obligate parasite, which means it only lives on plants. It can't do anything to us. It doesn't have the mouth part to do it. Now, there are nematodes that affect people, you know, obviously, pinworms and things like that, but the plant parasitic ones don't go to anything but plants. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about that part, <laughs> at least. Yeah, believe me, part of, part of the attraction for me of plant pathology, even though you get paid better in the medical field, was you can't catch the diseases. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get root rot, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to get a leaf spot. <laughs> so, all right. We're, we're working here from the smallest, tiniest plant pathogens up. And viroids are only on plants. There is no animal equivalent to a viroid exactly. And this is just a little piece of DNA, of DNA or RNA, I think it's RNA, all <coughs> tightly wound. And that's all it is. And it just, it looks like this under the electron microscope. You can't see it with a regular microscope. So, it, and it needs a vector, some kind of thing to move it around, either, you know, a person, like grafting, you can transmit viroids during grafting. Um, obviously, they're parasites, and there are limited control options. There's no spray you can put on there for it. So, pretty much, if you get a viroid disease, you either live with it or you destroy the plant. And we really only have one here that causes significant damage. And this is when somebody decides that their old avocado tree, they don't like that variety anymore, and they often top work it into a different variety. And then all of a sudden their, new, their fruit comes up with these blotches on it. And that's avocado sun blotch. And it's a viroid disease. So when it was in the old tree and maybe that tree, you know, wasn't susceptible to it, you didn't see it, but when you put the new variety on, you get it. Or maybe you transmitted it with the new variety, you know, I, I don't know which way, it, it can go either way. But that's the one that we see once in a while. It's not too common, but it is here. <clears throat> All right, we're working up the scale. <laughs> we're not doing just naked RNA anymore. We're, <laughs> we're having DNA or RNA with a protein code on it, viruses. And viruses come in all kinds of shapes. You've got the plate of spaghetti shape, which is, which is what I call that one. It's, um, that's actual, that's citrus tristeza virus there. It's a crossroad <coughs> virus. Um, somebody named it after the Greek word for spindles, but I don't know how you get a spindle out of that. But <laughs> that's a Gemini virus because the particles come in twos. They're, they're twinned. A icosahedral kind of like 20 sided twin balls sort of and then your tobacco mosaic virus your straight rigid rod and that's the the classic this was like the first virus ever described and it happened to be a plant virus not a people virus for once <laughs> <laughs> and because it's a it's a very stable virus it transmits very easily and if you're a smoker, it's on your hands. And then if you go handle a petunia or something, say a tomato or a pepper, you've transmitted it. It's a, it's a very stable virus that lasts through the smoking. It's on your hands, and it you know, moves around that way. Wow. Yeah. So. <laughs> but. Smokers don't touch I know. Yeah. OK. There are lots and lots of different virus families. And we won't go into a, um, many of them, but there are a few that are pretty important. Um, in patients, necrotic spot virus, that one pops up very frequently in nursery stuff. We see it a lot. Tomato spotted wilt virus, if you know where Legoland is now, if you remember, that used to be all tomato fields. Guess why the tomato fields weren't profitable anymore? spotted wilt virus got in there and wiped them out it, in the early 90s there. I mean, I saw it, I visited their fields, and it was just total wipeout. It was really depressing. <laughs> so um, citrus tristeza virus, we're quarantined for that. That's still a disease that we have here that they don't have in some parts of the Central Valley. So we, you know, you can't ship citrus from here to there at for certain things. 
And um, we've worked out how to deal with it. We have the right rootstock and the right scion that doesn't get it, that doesn't have the problem. But in the Central Valley, they still grow plants with the, where it would kill the rootstock if you got it. So um, cucumber mosaics fairly common. Um, a butylon mosaic is kind of an interesting one because when you see it on a butylon, you see this beautiful variegation. And you're looking at this beautifully variegated plant and you're going, wow, that's cool. I want it, but it's a virus. <laughs> it's, it's not a natural no, variegation. It's not a mutation. It's a virus. And it will spread to other things. That's how I believe a white fly transmitted virus. Potato virus Y, there's a lot of that around. All of the polyviruses were constantly certifying for things going to other countries. Say it must be free from something in the polyvirus family. It's a big family. There's like 200 viruses in there. And the tobacco mosaic virus family, um, also very important for tomatoes, peppers, those kinds of things. Petunias, anything in the Solanaceae. So. How do the viruses get around? Obviously, they don't have feet. So they're not jumping around by themselves. So um, some of them are seed transmitted. Some of them are pollen transmitted. That's a real problem in walnuts. There's a disease called walnut black line that's you know, spread in the wind by pollen. Um, insects, of course, are a major vector of many different kinds of viruses. There's a white fly. Our little uh, tobacco or silver leaf white fly, Babesia species, a very good vector of many viruses. Some of them are mite transmitted. Some of them, especially in the grapevines, are important because they're nematode transmitted. So if you were planting a vineyard, I would recommend that you get a nematode check of your soil first to make sure you don't have the specific kinds of nematodes that transmit some of the important grapevine viruses. You know, you probably don't want to use that ground if it's already loaded with a, a vector. And um, some of them are fungal transmitted, and some of them just move on hands. They're mechanically transmitted. Touch one. This happens a lot in orchids. Touch one plant with the orchid mosaic virus. Touch the next plant, you spread it. So just things to be on the lookout for. <laughs> OK. So what, what does a plant with a virus infection look like? It could be none. You could see no symptoms at all. It, that variety might be fairly resistant to it. Uh, you can have mosaics and models, which is what that is. Um, various leaf spots. Sometimes you've got stunting, yield loss, deformations, um, very weird distortions of the plant cell, or even sometimes plant death. It all depends on the virus, on the interaction. Yeah. So there's always a lot of, to learn. It's like learning a language. It depends. You know, it's not I before E except after C, but it depends. <laughs> so, OK. Here's some symptoms. Um, in patients, necrotic spot virus, because we get this one a lot through the nursery industry. There it is on cyclamen. It's a necrotic spot, dead spots. And there it is on stephanotis. You've got the um, dead spot in the middle, but these pretty little ring spots. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's kind of, it is kind of pretty. <laughs> But um, it's not good for the nursery industry. And in Rumor, there's no treatment for the virus, so those plants get destroyed. So all their work put into them that far are, is gone. So, and um, the Gemini viruses, this is, um, these are typically white fly transmitted, sometimes leaf hopper transmitted. And they're pretty much in your face. When you've got a Gemini virus infection, you pretty much know it. It's right there. It's it's distinctly bright yellow um, coloration, chlorosis there, intervenal chlorosis. You've got distortions. So that is often a problem on the in the Imperial Valley. They get a lot of problems with Gemini viruses over there, especially. And but the way you handle them, it's when they get sloppy with their plow down. 
because it's, since it's white fly transmitted, if you get rid of the white fly for a period, and they have to have a whole spring period, is where, say you're growing melons, and you get leaf curl virus in them. If you plow it all down, all at the same time, and everybody eliminates all their white flies, and then you replant, you know, a month later, you're okay. You can get rid of it that way by eliminating the vector. But if everybody just kind of, even though they harvested, they leave their stuff in the field and the white flies just multiply and multiply and multiply, then you have recurring problems with some of these viruses. So all they have to do is have a plow down day and everybody get rid of all your infected plants, old harvested plants at the same time. So, okay, diseases caused by bacteria. Again, with our very dry climate, we don't have a lot of them here, but these are the couple that we do have. So we have um, fire blight on the flowering pear trees, those ornamental trees. It also goes to fruit trees, obviously, pears and apples. But um, so the, the name of the bacteria is Erwinia amylabra. It's named for a guy named Erwin. His last name was Erwin, so it got named after him. And um, so there it is. It gets into the youngest growth. And how do you think it gets there? Bees. Bees, yeah. <laughs> That's the vector. And so it moves from tree to tree, from branch to branch with, with the bees. And so it gets in from the flower, and the flower just starts, it looks blasted, it's black. It looks like somebody took a blowtorch to the end. The tip often just crooks over, makes a crook. And um, so that's fire blight on the flowering pears all over the place. All right, other diseases. Um, these are the sneaky, the sneaky bacteria, the bacteria that you can't see under a regular microscope. So, oh yeah, that was, one was there, that one. That is bacterial streaming coming out of a leaf. It's a leaf infected with the bacteria, and those aren't bubbles, that's the bacteria coming off of it. That's how I do a quickie diagnosis a lot of times, is just put it under the microscope, cut it open, and watch the bacteria stream out. Yeah, so when you when you got a good one like that, it's like, whoa. <laughs> those are fun. Uh, but then there are the sneaky ones. These are the bacteria that live only in the phloem or only in the xylem. And um, Pierce's disease of grapevines and many other plants only lives in the xylem. That's, and the hint is in its name, xylella. And that's the water-carrying system of the plant. <coughs> And the fastidiosa means it's fastidious. It doesn't grow easily. It's almost an obligate parasite. It's really hard to culture. They can culture it now and grow it on a petri plate, but it's really hard. And it takes a complicated media to do it on. It's not that easy. But that's what happens to your vineyard if you get it. And um, there's the bacteria by itself. And, and that's one you can't see streaming. So you have to use an electron microscope to see it. They're that tiny. And here's the vector. That's the glassy wing sharpshooter, <laughs> which got here in the 90s and um, has been wreaking havoc with us and confusing us ever since. So because Pierce's disease is one of the oldest plant diseases recognized in California. It was named in the 1880s by the guy, it was named after the guy that the USDA in Washington sent out here to work on going, how come all those you know, vineyards in Orange County, California are dying? And it was Pierce's disease. So they sent this guy out here, his name was Pierce, and um, that's how he, he became immortal with that disease. <laughs> but this, is, this was taken in Temecula, where um, in the early 90s, again, they had a total wipeout of vineyards in Temecula up there. They just, it, the disease, when the glassy wing sharpshooter got here, we knew it was transmitted by native sharpshooters. And, we, and then they were typically along riparian areas. It was typically along the edges of the vineyard. So they, they kind of knew how to control that. They were used to working with it that way, but they didn't know about once the glassy wing sharpshooter got here, it's a really efficient vector. It feeds further in. It feeds on the tr main trunk of the, of the um, grapevine so that it wasn't just getting inoculated at the young tips where you prune them off sometimes 
in the winter and, and you get rid of the disease. This one, when it's feeding on the trunk and inoculates the trunk, the plant dies a lot faster. So it, it, it changed the whole dynamic of how we deal with it. And now the, now the focus on controlling the disease is also controlling the insect. And, and Temecula had a unique situation because you had um, grapevines right next to citrus groves. And no one, no one was paying any attention to the, um, the glassy wing sharpshooter, which has a whole, huge host list, which loves to feed on things. But in the winter, guess what it was feeding on? All that citrus. And it was, and the populations were exploding. You know, they were, they would build up huge populations in the citrus in the winter. And then when the grapes started leafing out in the spring, well, the, they, the leaf hoppers were bored with, with <laughs> citrus by that time. They were like, okay, we've had enough of this, but look at this young, tender, new thing right here. And they were moving over to the grapes and transmitting the disease. So. There's another shot of what happened. Dead vineyards all over the place. So which sparked a whole bunch, you know, the growers, the USDA, everybody put up some money to work on it. And though we don't have a cure, we've got handling it figured out, at least. But when that sharpshooter came to Earth, yeah, the sharpshooter came here from the southeast US, it also brought different strains of the bacteria that California had never had before. And that's what's also keeping us jumping around as it, it goes to liquid amber. There's a strain that goes to liquid amber. And of course, the first one we noticed was oleander leaf scorch, when all the oleanders in the freeway median started to die. And they're still dying. Um, there is a strain that goes to citrus, though it's not here yet. It's in Brazil, but it's working its way up. So there's a, you know, that's one thing we're always looking for is we hope it never gets here, but and the big one is the strain on olive. <coughs> we're we're seeing lots of olive trees go down in the county right now due to this disease. And again, it's incurable. There there really isn't much you can do about it except remove the tree or control the vector in the first place so your tree doesn't get it. But yes, does it matter the age of the plant or more established? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yeah, I've seen people's specimen. You know. 150-year-old olives go down. So, yeah, it's it's sad, but that is what's happening. Oh, did I? How big is the glassy wing? It's yeah, about that big. Okay. It's hard to spot though because it's really sneaky. If you approach it, yeah. it's best to do it in the morning when it's cold, so it's not moving so fast. Because if you approach it. It moves around to the other side <laughs> of the branch, so you can't see it. <laughs> it's really sneaky. Yeah, <laughs> it kind of looks like a frog sitting there, though. It's <laughs> so it, it's you know once you get used to looking for it, it, you can spot it. But if you if you're not used to it and nobody's ever pointed it out to you, it's hard. So yeah, um, imidacloprid. The neonicotinoids you use a systemic insecticide in the vineyards. They do it once a year. You know, if you treat it in May, April, May, when it's first breaking, when it's first kind of coming, the leaves are coming out. That's you're done. You know, pretty much you don't have to do it again the rest of the year. But that is the if you want to keep your vineyard for a long time, that is kind of the way you have to do it in areas where the glassy wing sharpshooter are. And that is also an important thing that our department does a lot of. We have a whole glassy wing sharpshooter program to prevent everything going up to, say, Napa and Sonoma counties, areas that do not have the glassy wing sharpshooter. Any nursery stock, because it's got a lot of hosts, gets inspected, They're like leaf by leaf. Yeah, and they have a trapping program, so when a nursery when gets more sharpshooters than allowed, they have to spray to control it. Because you cannot, you cannot ship. Napa and Sonoma counties come down on you really hard with even one egg mass on a leaf in a shipment. They're, they're really serious about keeping that bug out of their areas. <coughs> so. Okay, the other really bad bacterial disease that we never want to see here is Juan Lumbi. And this is one, it's kind of, it's also vector transmitted, and this one lives in the phloem. 
Pierce's disease lives in the bacteria live in the xylem. This one lives in the phloem, in the sugar carrying system of the plant. So it's going to disrupt, you know, sugar is moving down into the roots to keep the roots healthy. So a lot of times the symptoms that you see kind of look like root rot at first. Because when this bacteria is inoculated into the tree by the Asian citrusillin, it tends to go down, tends to move down in a plant. So it's killing roots first. And then it kind of moves back up again into the leaves where you detect it. So um, symptoms of that disease can be one-sided yellowing of the tree. And these are the very first tree that was ever found in California infected with Juan Long Bing. These are samples from it. And they were in the Hacienda Heights area of Los Angeles County, where we still have the quarantine. Um, and they found that was 2012. Then we didn't. We had one tree, one infected tree, and then until 2015, we didn't have anything else. And then last summer, in July and August, it was like, bam, we found a tree. Bam, we found a tree. Bam, we found a tree. It was like, no, two more trees today. It was, it was like, whoa, for for July and August last summer, up to 10 trees. So they, and this is one where the state comes into your yard and rips the tree out, wow. roots and all. Seriously, they're very, very serious about it. This is. They do come into your yard, they do rip the tree out, they dig all the roots out. So this is a really serious disease. And the citrus industry is 100% behind them. And in Florida, they already went through this, with, it already went up to the whole Supreme Court because people said, no, we, I don't care if I have a sick tree and it's going to die and it's going to affect everybody else. You can't come into my yard and take out the tree. Um, that went to the Supreme Court and they said, yes, you can. Wow. Yes, you can, because it's for the better benefit of everybody else. Yeah, I'm from Florida, and if they found one in your neighborhood, they ripped out everybody. Wow. Whoa. If they found it infected or not, they're just like, Ouch. everybody within like half a mile to a mile. Yeah. Went in oh, and wow. it, and you walked out, you didn't, all of a sudden you saw this tag, and you're like. <sighs> yeah, California, they're just taking trees that test positive at this time. But while you're there, if, they, if you want to get your other trees, which are probably also infected, taken out at the same time, California is willing to do that for you. So, Do they bury the plants also? Um, yeah, but so far most of them are going straight up to various labs. They're going either to the, um, the state lab in Sacramento, because we don't have it here, so no one can study it very well. So they keep, you know, they're studying it. They're, they're trying to isolate the bacteria. They're trying to do new tests to, to, you know, to improve their methods. Um, so it's either going to UC Davis, UC Riverside, or um, Sacramento. But in the case of like last summer when they had 10 trees all of a sudden, then some of them were buried. And then just what it was, a week before last, they had two more in the same area of Los Angeles. So. Yeah, so we're up to a total of 13 positive trees in California so far. Yeah. So just because you've got those psyllids all over your tree does not mean that your tree is infected with the Correct. Bacteria. Correct. Because we found the first psyllid in, in California, right here in San Diego County, in 2008. And we did not find an infected tree till 2012. So, so the and we. are just munching away. They're just a pest. Right. The tree would be. Chlorotic, chlorotic is the word? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the tree won't necessarily be chlorotic because of the psyllid. The psyllid's a minor pest, kind of like aphids. Right. From the bacteria, you would see the disease starting to show. Right. Right. Yep. And if it's got the disease, one of the key characteristics on the leaves is asymmetrical chlorosis. It's turning yellow in a pattern that doesn't match on either side of the mid vein, say. So, um, you know, you've got this yellow blob here, but that corresponding area on the opposite side of the leaf is still green. So, and you want to double check these. See, again, here you've got yellow and you've got green on the opposite side. So, um, but you want to double check because you can get fooled because sometimes that yellow patch is really just, if you flip the leaf over, a white fly patch. You know, there's a white a colony of white flies underneath there. So you got to be really careful. But, and I have not personally seen this disease yet, but all the people who I know who do diagnostic say, when you see it, you know, you'll know. <laughs> this is one of those diseases that you may have never seen it before, but if you, you know, if you have any knowledge of plant disease, you'll know that, uh-oh, this is one to be worried about. So yes? 
So if the psyllid carries the disease, but you found one in 2008 and didn't find the disease until 2012, I mean, is it a guarantee? Do you know what the transmission rate is? Um, well, as far as we know, those psyllids were not infected at that time. So they got here without the disease, and every single psyllid does not have the disease. So they've got to have an infected tree to feed on to get the disease. Okay. So, but, yeah. All right, so, and anyway, eventually the tree dies. It drops all its fruit, it dies. So, you know, you, your best bet is to get it out. If you do have an infected tree, just get it out of there as fast as you can anyway. Your fruit will be misshapen and it will taste bad. Mm -hmm. So, um, now, misshapen fruit does not necessarily mean it's got one long thing because we have another disease here called citrus stubborn that makes a similar thing with the fruit. Um, the bottom half of the fruit won't ever change color completely. It'll stay kind of green. That's why that old name citrus green. And then again, you have the asymmetrical coloration in the leaf. So, again, another, another shot of the greening. Here's the bacteria in the plum, right there. So, and these are the, um, the eggs, the egg stage of the, of the psyllid. And they're really, really tiny. You, you kind of need a hand lens to see them. And they will be in the newest growth. So look for them in the new flush. And they, the trees are probably starting to flush right now. So look for them in the new flush. And they're really tiny, but they're golden yellow. And then there's the adult psyllid, and it's got evil red eyes. <laughs> and it's this mottly brown thing. And again, it's really tiny also. It's only about the size of an Argentinian ant. Very small. And they're really sneaky also. They also, if they see you coming, they move around to the other side of the, of the branch so that you can't, they're really hard to find. So, and they always, when they're feeding, they're sitting there at this 45 degree angle. They're always, at, they feed at an angle. So they're jutting out from the, from the branch. So, and then of course there's, that's Florida, the eventual deaths. Florida's lost half of its citrus in history now, so half gone. Wow. So that's all those jobs, you know, all that, all that money um, gone. So their lime industry's gone. Makes our lime growers very happy still, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's not a good thing. Here's the um, quarantine area for the Asian citrus psyllid, this hatch mark area um, up in Kern County, pretty much all of it. Patches everywhere in the valley, but pretty much all of Southern California. The Asian citrus psyllid is everywhere there. Since we first found it in 2008 at the border. But we didn't know at the time that there was a huge infestation of Asian citrus psyllid in Los Angeles County. We found it first in San Diego. LA was slapping off. You know, and they, they didn't find it. They didn't find it as early as maybe they could have. But, and then these are the two areas where they found the disease now. And this is the Hacienda Heights area, which just borders Orange County, and then right next to it is the San Gabriel area where they found the 10 trees last summer. The two new ones last week, the other week, were here in the Hacienda Heights quarantine area. So. We keep looking, the state has a big, big program searching for this. You know, they're, they're, say, they're sampling psyllids and testing them and testing trees constantly, thousands of them. So, and when you've got something like this happen, then you've got, then they go out and pull an extra 6,000 samples. So, all right. All right, nematodes, one more thing. This is, this is the largest organism, sort of, that causes a, a plant problem. And they're, again, invisible to the naked eye, even though it's a multicellular organism. And that's our little reniform nematode right there, which is a quarantine pest, which does not cause this. But that's root knot nematode damage on a tomato plant. So if you, if you rip out your tomato plant, or anything that's not a legume, because remember, legumes have, have natural nodules on them, so you can't confuse them. But um, if you've got something that you pull it out and, the, and they look swollen and clubby and, and they call them knots, have all these 
gnarly things on them, that's probably nematodes. And those are pretty easy to cut open, and uh, adult female in there, when you cut open those roots, she's a tiny, you, you can actually see her with the naked eye, about slightly smaller than a grain of sand, pearly white round thing. And um, mm. anyway, a few thousand of them will totally stunt your tomato plant or your pepper plant or your cabbage plant or whatever, and you won't get a very good yield out of it. And of course, they are soil born, so if you move the soil around, you're moving the nematode too. And they will move with water as the water goes down. So, um, but there are lots of different kinds of nematodes, but you really need to do the test for them. And we do that in my lab. I do thousands of them every year. So it's not, not really a big deal to do a nematode test and look at, oh, look at that one that you've got. <laughs> There's like maybe 10 genera that are really important that we get here all the time. So it's, it's not too complicated, but they are hard to get rid of. Pretty much once they're in your soil, they're there forever. Oh, yeah, you're stuck with them. Yes? Yes. I mean, I remember the garden, I feel like they see them everywhere. Mm -hmm. like they're just almost like a given. They're less common in clay soil because these, of course, are an organism that needs oxygen and clay soil has less oxygen in it, so they love nice sandy soil. So if you're along the coast, more you see more of it with that nice sandy soil than you do a little inland where it's got a heavy clay. You don't see them as much there. But yes? Does anything eat them? There are other nematodes that eat them. There are you know, kind of carnivorous nematodes that eat them. There are fungi that eat them, um, that actually use them as a nitrogen source. So <laughs> there are other bacteria that are that parasitize them too. So there there are a few things that eat them, yeah. But as far as complete control, you know, you, you never get that with biological control. So your best bet if you've got them is to find varieties that are resistant. You know, if you're if you're growing this, there are tomato varieties and, and stuff that are resistant to nematodes. It should be on the label. Just plant resistant varieties, that's your best bet. Or, or you're going to container gardening, you know, you could do that so, and make sure that the soil doesn't get into your container too. So, <laughs> yes? Just a question, do, 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 can the nematodes live in, in like the soilless media that they use in the nurseries? Yes, yes, they do very well, as long as there are roots there for them to live on because they can only live on living plant material, yes. They'll do very well in the soilless medium. It's actually, they like it because it's got more air, lighter. Yep. Okay, time for break. Exactly 25 minutes. Oh, yes. Oh.